percent of four hundred fifty five dollars equals forty five dollars and fifty cents but I only have forty six dollars in cash I wonder if I could take my change out of the basket God you've been so good to me thank you for your provision in my life where does all this money go shouldn't the pastors know that we need softer toilet paper in the bathroom I think that instead of giving money this week, I'll buy the toilet paper that I like and give it to the church. Lord, you know my needs. I give this in faith. Please cover my debts and make my car last a long time. Since I sent my money to that television evangelist this week, I'll count that as my tithe. Mom gave me a dollar and I get to put it in. Why do we do that anyway? As soon as I get out of debt, I'll start tithing. 10%? Where does that come from? What happens if I only give 5%? No, wait, that's too hard. God, I know you see how much money I give. I hope these pastors appreciate it. Okay, God, you know I'm giving more than the usual 10% this week, so next week, I'm keeping it all. I cleaned the sanctuary this week. That's worth about $50. What do you know? That's 10% of what I make. I'm covered. I want us to ask ourselves the very personal question this morning. How do we view our finances? How do we view our finances? To start off with, we must understand that money is neither good nor bad. Corrupt people will use money to do evil things, while good people can use money to do righteous things. Though money is morally neutral, what people do with money reflects their internal morality. I've heard it said if you want to know how someone truly is, then, then, then give them abundance of money. Listen, there's nothing wrong with having stuff, but don't let stuff have you. Our American dream mentality worships the God of materialism. Listen, the Bible does not forbid the possession of money. In fact, Deuteronomy 8.18, we are told that God gives the power to make wealth. And in 1 Timothy 6.17, we are told that God richly supplies us with what? All good things. Wow. Money is not bad. Money's not bad. However, the love of money is. 
the love of money is. The scripture tells us that the love of money is what the root of all evil. Loving money makes people forget God. It causes us to rely on ourselves rather than God. Listen, before I go any further, I want to make it abundantly clear that I do not believe in what is called the prosperity of gospel. I do not hold to that theology. In fact, I will tell you it's out of the pits of hell. <laughs> I do not believe that God's will for every believer is to be materially wealthy. You don't find that anywhere in the Bible. However, I do believe that God uses finances to teach us how to be spiritually prosperous in Him. God wants His people to what? To be a giving people. So if you would, please take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to be in verses 1 through 5 as we examine raw aspects of grace giving. Raw aspects of grace giving. So if you got your place in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're going to be in verses 1 through 5. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, was, and this, was, uh, and this not was expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. You see, the first raw aspect of grace giving is relational giving relational giving. In verse 1 we read, we want you to know brothers about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Listen, in this verse we see that giving shows a relational grace. It shows a relational grace. In this chapter the word grace occurs seven times and it occurs three times in chapter 9. In both chapter 8 and chapter 9, the subject is about grace giving. Paul was telling the church at Corinth about the churches in Macedonia that were monetarily giving above and beyond to the cause of Christ. Macedonia was in the northern part of modern Greece. The churches that Paul had, had in mind in Macedonia were Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. So these were the three churches in Macedonia. Macedonia was an extremely poor region. It was a poor region. It had been ravaged by wars and plundered by the Romans. However, despite their condition of poverty, these believers were known for their generosity. The church at Corinth had no idea of the magnitude of the Macedonians' generous giving. This is why Paul begins by saying, we want you to know, brothers, the Corinthians did not know of the Macedonian sacrifice. They did not know about their sacrificial giving. So Paul writes to them, he says, we want you to know, brothers, these churches were coming together to raise funds for the church in Jerusalem. From its birth on the day of Pentecost, the Jerusalem church had to cope with extreme poverty of many of its members. The Jerusalem church was a church of poverty. Wow. When we talk about prosperity theology, and in that theology they, they say that Everybody is meant to be wealthy. And people want to know, well, who teaches this? Benny Hinn teaches this stuff. Kenneth Copeland teaches this stuff. Paula White teaches this stuff. T.D. Jakes teaches this stuff. They all teach prosperity theology. And it's horrible. Because if their theology was true, then Jerusalem would have been a very wealthy church. 
Guess what? Jerusalem was in extreme poverty. They were struggling. They didn't have an abundance of, of material wealth. Now why did they struggle in this area? What made the Jerusalem church struggle in this area? There's three main areas. Uh, first, the Jerusalem church consisted largely of pilgrims. What does that mean? In other words, many, if not most, of the converts were visiting Jerusalem to celebrate the day of Pentecost when the church was born. So you had a, a lot of visiting people in Jerusalem. How many people came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost? 3,000 people, majority of them being pilgrims. How many other Christians were there around the world at the time? Zero. Where did they have to stay in order to be disciples? They had to stay in Jerusalem. Listen, it says there were no churches or Christians anywhere else in the world. The converted pilgrims remained where? They remained in Jerusalem. Only there in Jerusalem could they sit under the apostles' teaching and find fellowship with other believers. Many could not afford to pay their prices to stay in local inns and and many were alienated from their families because of their faith in Christ. Therefore, the pilgrims and outcasts lived where? They lived with fellow believers. They lived with other Christians. They said, hey, you need to learn about Jesus. Come stay with me. Many of these believers were also poor. So guess what? These people who had nothing... We're giving everything they had to other believers. Wow. Many of these believers were also poor, so housing a thousand, uh, thousands of new converted pilgrims would have been a great hardship for them. Now, another reason for the Jerusalem church's poverty was persecution. It was persecution. New converts lost their jobs. New converts lost their businesses. They were ostracized by their family and friends because of their faith in Jesus Christ. What would happen if you were just somebody to walk up to you and say, you, uh, because of your faith, we are, you're losing your job. You're losing your way of life. How would you feel? Listen, what we see in our text is that the believers in Jerusalem took these pilgrims in. All right. Lastly, another reason for the Jerusalem church's poverty was the general poor economic climate of the region. Listen, the Romans extracted all they could from the conquered territories, seizing the resources and imposing a heavy burden of taxation. The result was a rampant poverty in Israel. Adding to the region's economic woes was also a worldwide famine. Wow. In Acts 2, 44 through 45, we see that the Jerusalem church tried its best to meet the needs of its poor members. Notice this, it says, And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distrib distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They were trying to meet the needs within the church of Jerusalem, but it was so great they couldn't do it. They couldn't maintain it over and over again. So Paul makes a plea to other churches. And he says, listen, the church in Jerusalem is suffering can you, I'm asking believers, can you help them out? Can you help them? Paul recognized these needs and asked the churches, he asked the church of Jerusalem, Asia Minor, Europe, to take up a collection. At the end of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he mentioned the collection to them, asking them to contribute. This isn't the first time the church in Corinth had heard about this collection. This is the first time. However, because of the Corinthian church's sin issues, we talked about last week, the Corinthian church was a messed up church. In fact, if you wanted to put a title to the church of Corinth, we could call it the church gone wild. They were nuts. 
We got to remember, we talked about last week, the church in Corinth, they worshiped sex. And this wasn't something that you could just turn off. What did they do? Paul had to write to the church in Corinth about their sinful sexual behaviors. He's saying You're, you need to quit acting this way. Well, what happens when you confront people with their sin? They get mad. The Corinthian church got mad at Paul. In fact, they rebelled against Paul. And therefore, they lost contact with him. Therefore, they lost contact about the collection that was being taken up amongst other churches. They knew about it, but they had lost all connection with it. All right? Understand that. Now we see in our text that these sin issues have been resolved. At the time this was written, these sin issues that had happened within the Corinthian church were beginning to be resolved. They were beginning to listen to Paul and they were accepting his biblical Christian pastoral advice. They were accepting his correction. Fellowship had been restored between Paul and the church. And now Paul is telling them about the collection. He's telling them, hey, listen, remember the collection I, I told you about in my last letter? He said, let, 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 I'm going to tell you more about it. What, he, what we see Paul doing, he's teaching the church in Corinth. He's teaching them about what it means to be a grace-giving church. He's teaching them about what it means to be a grace-giving church. He was using the churches in Macedonia as an example of what it means to give unto the Lord. You see, the Macedonians did not give the uh, give uh, 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 the Macedonian church did not give like worldly rich people often do. They did not give to be seen or heard. They did not give like the Pharisees, the horns, the clanging symbols. They did not give us just mere a, a token of their riches without sacrifices. They did not give so that they could get more stuff from God. The Macedonians gave numerously and abundantly, consistent with Christ's command to do this. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In our text, Paul shuts out all thoughts of good works by noting that they gave simply out of the abundance of what? God's grace. They did not give to gain favor with God. They didn't sit there and say, God, I'm giving you a portion of my money so you don't curse me. It, it, it didn't seek anything out of it. They gave out of the abundance of God's grace. Wow. The reason that the churches in Macedonia gave such grace is because they had a right relationship with God. Listen, my friends, if you've experienced the grace of God, then, you, then, then, then giving, grace giving will be a natural reaction. Amen. It will be a natural reaction. It has been said that if you want to see where people's interest is, look at their checkbook. Where we spend our money reflects our spiritual condition. Jesus said in Matthew 6.31, for where your treasure is, there is your heart will be also. Just look at the Corinth, church in Corinth that, 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 that giving was at, at halted because of their sin issues in their church. Why did the church in Corinth quit giving to the offering to Jerusalem? Because they were mad at Paul. They were mad because Paul was dealing with their sin issues. My friends, listen to me. I'm going to tell you what will keep someone from giving to the Lord more than anything. is open sin in their life. 
Open sin in your life does nothing but sit there and halt our giving to the Lord. Because guess what? Our eyes are not on Him. Our eyes are on ourselves. We're too busy pointing fingers at everybody else instead of looking at the three pointing back at us. Wow. When our heart is not right with God, we do not have a desire to give graciously. Whether we realize it or not, we, we become inward focused. It no longer is a priority in our lives. Listen, if we have mounted more debt toward worldly possessions than we have in a lifetime of giving to the Lord, then we need to examine our hearts. Do we care more about things than we do the Lord? Wow. God does not want his people living in debt. He does not want his people living in debt. Romans 13, 1, Paul writes, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Psalms 37, 21 says this, The wicked borrows, but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. When a believer lives within the means, they are free to give more gracious unto the Lord. Let's make this clear. God does not need your money. He don't need your money. He is the maker and sustainer of the universe. Do you think he needs it? If you want to give even more, even more personal, it's not really your money. It's not my money. It's not your money. It's his money. It's his stuff. What God has allowed you to have in yours. Is his. The act of grace giving exactly that. It is acknowledging that what you have has been given to you by the grace of God. This is why the church of Macedonia could give with extravagant grace. They were overwhelmed by the grace of God in their lives. And because they were over overwhelmed with the grace of God in their lives, they said, here it is. We don't have nothing. You know why? Because it's not ours anyway. It's not mine anyway. Here it is. These were people who gave out of extreme poverty. And they realized that even... What they did have wasn't theirs. And they gave it away. They gave it away. Not only do we see relational grace, we also see relational suffering. In verse 2 we read, For in severe test of affliction, for in severe test of affliction. Paul was tell, tells the church that the Macedonians graciously gave during a severe test of affliction. Notice that Paul uses the word severe. These are not just, just flippant words put on the page. These are meant for us to understand what they are. And guess what he says? They are severe fam. This is a, 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 a severe test of affliction. Which can be interpreted to mean great, much, or many. The word indicates the extreme trials and tribulations that they were going through. Figuratively, figuratively, it describes the spiritual pressure the Macedonians endured from the poverty and persecution. In fact, Acts 17, 5 through 8, Paul and Silas describes for us the suffering of the church in Macedonia. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the, of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out of the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason had received them, and they all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus, and the people in the city and the city authorities were, uh, were disturbed when they heard these things. Man, these were people who were getting kicked out of their house. Weren't 
for the sake of Jesus. But yet these were some gracious people who gave everything they had to them. Wow. Paul also referred to persecution in the epistles of the Macedonian churches. 1 Thessalonians 1.6 says this, You also became imitators of us, of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation. Who was this talking to? The Macedonian church. Going through tribulation. Uh, tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. 2 Thessalonians 1.4 Therefore we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endured. Philippians 1.29 For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him but also to suffer for his sake. These were all mentioning uh, 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 the church of Macedonia severe persecution. Oh, my friends, the Macedonian churches did not let their situation get in the way of serving the Lord. He did not let their trials and tribulations, they did not let their suffering get in the way of serving the Lord. Wow. It has been said that if you want to know how a person really is, then watch them go through adversity. The Macedonian churches did not come, uh, did, did not become self-consumed by their trials and tribulations. What happens when we go through trials and tribulations and we watch people in their lives that do one of two things? Either they wind up focusing on other people or they become inward focused and inward and self-consumed. Wow. The Macedonian church did not become self-consumed. In fact, they became the opposite of being siblings. They, they did not sit around and say, well, poor pitiful me. Oh, well, I got kicked out of my house. I lost my job. They didn't have a pity party. No. Instead, they were thinking about how they could help the church in Jerusalem. In fact, these churches knew how to identify with their pain and suffering. Listen, do you know why the Macedonians could give with such grace? It's because they identified with the poverty that the Jerusalem church was going through. So we understand what it means to have nothing. We understand what it means to, to go through suffering. We understand what it means to go through tribulations. And you know what? We want to help you out because we understand how it feels. We understand it. And we want to help you, brother. We want to help you, sister. They empathize with them. My friends, my, listen to this. This is what Christ does in our own lives. This is what he does. When the reason we can be compassionate, the reason we can empathize with others is because God has allowed us to be in the same position. Listen, the reason a person with cancer can identify with somebody who's been dealing with cancer, why? Because they've been there. A person who's had the lights turned off in their house because, listen, man, your hours got cut that way. Guess what happens? That person knows how to identify with somebody who's struggling. They can identify, they can empathize. Why? See, the Macedonians did not, did not allow their situation to have a negative effect on helping financially to the church in Jerusalem. These were people who were giving out of their own poverty. They did not sit there and say, man, I don't have it to give. Oh, tough luck. That's not what they did. They dug deep. They gave sacrifice. They put the needs of other believers whom they had never met ahead of their own. They did not let their suffering stop them from helping and loving the body of Christ. Oh, my friends, devout Christians give no matter what the situation. Because even the worst circumstances can hinder their devotion to Jesus 
Christ. Listen, it doesn't matter. A person who genuinely loves the Lord, who is saved by faith in Jesus Christ, guess what? It's called the perseverance of the saints. And what we see in the life of the Macedonians is that they persevered. They were believers in Jesus Christ. And their trials and tribulations did not stop them from doing what God had called them to do. My friends, listen, that's what the way a true believer should be. Listen, we can look at a checkbook and go, man, I don't know if I can do it this week. I don't, know if I, I don't know if I can give this week. I don't know if I can do this this week. But we'll find time to go out to eat and do what we want. Doesn't keep us from that. Amen. But whenever we sit back and have to give to the Lord, it becomes more difficult. It becomes more difficult. But for those who have a relationship with the Lord, grace giving should become a natural part of their life. Christ is the perfect example of grace giving. He gave all of himself what? for us. For us. He left the glory of heaven to what walk among us. He walked among men. In Hebrews, we are told that Christ came to empathize with humanity. Christ knows all about our pain and suffering. Guess what? He knows what it feels like to be poor. Guess what? A lot of people want to paint Jesus out to be this big rich man who walked the earth. He was not. He was just like you and me. Never once do we ever hear Jesus saying this. This is too hard. I'm going back home. Christ knows all about our pain and suffering. Before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed in the garden, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus willingly gave his life for you and for me. He did it because he loves us. Well, my friends, this is what motivated the church in Macedonia to give graciously, and this is what should motivate us to give graciously. The church identified with the relational suffering of Christ. By their sacrificial giving, it was their way of identifying with the suffering of the Lord. That's how they identify. Not only do we see the relational grace and relational suffering, but next we see the relational joy. In verse 2 we read, For the severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Paul was telling the church in Corinth that churches in Macedonia were giving out of what? Their abundance of what? Joy. Wait a minute. These people were going through extreme poverty. People were losing their home. People were losing their job because they were walking with the Lord. But our text says here, they did it out of the abundance of joy. They gave out of what? The abundance of joy. Hmm. Yes, they were suffering trials and tribulations, but guess what? They had joy. These were people who lived in extreme poverty, but they experienced the joy of giving unto the Lord. Notice that our text says they experienced the abundance. It's the abundance of joy. This word means an overflow. It means the cup ran over full of joy. So the church was experiencing an overflow of the grace of God. The joy that they were experiencing does not mean that they were walking around with a stupid grin on their face. This joy came from the Holy Spirit. In fact, joy is part of the fruit of the Spirit listed in Galatians chapter 5. Their joy went beyond what their pain and suffering. They understood that their blessing was in the giving and not in the receiving. Oh, my friends, they did not let poverty hinder their giving. Our text says that they lived in extreme what? Poverty. The Greek word poverty describes those with almost nothing. 
Listen to that. The Greek word poverty describes those with almost nothing, people who are forced to beg to survive. Hmm. Paul used the same word to describe Christ's poverty in verse 9 of our text when he stated, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Wow. Giving unto the Lord has nothing to do with your economic situation. It does not matter, matter whether you're rich or poor. We are to give unto the Lord what graciously and joyfully. The result of this joy, joyful, gracious, giving heart was what? Generosity. The result of this, of this joyous heart was generosity. Our text says their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed and a wealth of generosity on their part. Wow. My friend, spiritual maturity should always lead what? To generous giving. The pain and suffering of these believers had caused them to grow in their faith. I've heard it said that pain and suffering will either make you bitter or it will make you better. In the case of the Macedonians, it caused them to grow better. They overflowed with what? Generosity. Their joyful grace giving demonstrated a close relationship with God. Listen, as we grow in our giving, as we mature in our walk with God, I want to go ahead and tell you this. I've experienced this in my own life. Giving becomes such an overflow of what you are. It's just natural. Listen. It becomes such a joy. You want to give everything you got in the bank away. It's a joy in giving. You see, there's a lot of text within the scripture that talks about finances. It talks about saving money. It talks about retiring. It talks about all kinds of things. Saving up for the future. These are all, they're all biblical principles. But we don't do it so that we can build bigger barns and accumulate material wealth. We do it because it will free us to give more to the Lord. To give more to Him. To give back to Him. See, when we, when we give him to the Lord, it's supposed to be a reminder for us of his grace and his mercy. When we put money in our offering plates, guess what? It, it's reminding us every time we do it that what I have is not mine. It's the Lord's. It's not mine. It's not my money. It's his money. Oh, it caused the Macedonians to grow better and not bitter. They overflowed with generosity. The joyful grace giving demonstrated a close relationship with God. When we grow in our walk with Jesus Christ, the more we grow with Him, the more we mature in our faith, guess what? The more the joy of giving becomes a joy. It becomes a joy. It's part of the maturity of the believer. When I tell young Christians and we start talking about offering and about giving unto the Lord, and we start talking about it, I said, listen, I'm going to tell you, I don't worry about it. So I, 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 listen, I talk about finances in the church, they're important. We'll talk about them a little bit. But I'm going to tell you this I don't worry about it. I don't worry about it. Because it's God's church, He takes care of it. It's His church. Takes care of it. But as we grow in our faith in the Lord, part of grace giving comes with maturity. It comes with maturity. The Macedonians had confidence that God would supply all their needs. This freed them to give joyfully and generously. 
Mature Christians do not wait until they have more money. They give despite their poverty. Jesus himself pointed out this very thing by using the example of the widow in Luke 21, 1 through 4. The widow only put in two copper coins. And this is what Jesus said. Truly I tell you, the poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they have contributed out of their abundance. But she out of the poverty put in all she had to live. Joyful, gracious giving is not a matter of how much money you possess, but it is an expression of an unselfish and loving heart. The fact that the Macedonians did not allow their poverty to corrupt their generosity made them models of Christian giving. Listen, do we believe that the Lord will supply our needs? Do we believe that He does? What does it reflect in our giving? Are we looking for the physical instead of the spiritual? It does not matter the amount we give, but we are giving it joyfully. It doesn't matter the amount, but are we giving it joy? The attitude of the heart. This is why the first raw aspect of grace giving is a relational giving. And if we do not have the right relationship with God, then it will be reflected in the way that we give. The, raw, the first raw aspect of grace giving is a relational giving. And the second raw aspect of grace giving is a truthful giving. In verse 3 we read, For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, beyond their means of their own accord. In this verse Paul was saying, I have seen their generosity for myself. I've eyewitnessed it. Their churches in Macedonia gave uh, proportionately according to their means. They gave according to their means. The Bible does not uh, have a set fixed amount or percentage for giving. Not in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel required, were required to give a, a tithe of 10% of their income to the temple. And look, we can talk about, do a whole series on, on Old Testament tithing. But we're talking about New Testament grace giving. There's a difference. There's a difference. Instead, the New Testament giving is to be according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Any fixed amount of or percentage would prove sacrificial for some, but in, uh, inconsequential for others. However, we see that the church of Macedonia gave what beyond their ability. Yes, they gave according to what they had, but in proportions, they were sacrificial. To us, it might look like a minuscule amount. But for them, it was all they could give. They gave sacrificially. Their giving was above and beyond for such a poor congregation. These people faced extreme poverty and persecution. However, they did not let their circumstances get in the way of their giving. These people gave with no regard for themselves. They were compelled by their needs of the church in Israel. They believed God's promises to supply their needs. Therefore, they refused to worry about it. Nowhere in our text did we see where anybody in the church of Macedonia was anxious about what they gave. They weren't anxious. They weren't worried. They knew God would supply their needs because they were being obedient to the Lord. Oh, my friends, they placed their full dependence on God. Oh, my friends, God knows what we have. He knows because He gave it to us. He knows what's in our bank account. He knows what our lifestyle is like. He knows. He knows how we spend our money. Listen, we are to give in proportion to what we have. Wow. Every church has members who give sacrificially every week. Like, like the Macedonians, they give beyond their ability. They give of their own accord. They don't use money to manipulate or, or as a power play within the church. They give out of their sincerity of their heart. They give with the abundance of joy and their wealth of generosity. 
There was never any fanfare. No one ever knew the amount they gave. No one ever knew uh, that they gave sacrificially. Oh, my friends, this is the absolute truth of grace giving. What we give is between us and God. It is truly a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. Not only do we see proportionate truth, we also see a voluntary truth. In verse 3, we also see that they gave of their own what? Their own accord. This does not mean they had homes. They gave of their own accord. This text tells us that the churches of Macedonians gave voluntary. No one twisted their arms to give. No one gave them a guilt trip. They were not pressured to give in any way. And the Greek, this phrase is encompassed into one word which refers to one who chooses their own course of action. In fact, Paul might not have directly asked the Macedonians to even give. Instead, they simply heard about the need from other believers. Some of you might be sitting there asking, what do you mean to tell me Paul asked a bunch of poor, poverty-stricken people that were being persecuted to go in and, 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 put, and give their money in a collection? When we ought to be taking up a collection for them who? Isn't that what we think? Paul, never once do we see a record where Paul asked the Macedonians to give a dime. Paul never asked, but in fact, it was the opposite. It was the opposite. In verse 10, this is what we read of our, of, of our chapter. And this is the matter I give my judgment. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. In other words, what Paul saying is this. Remember, in our last, in our last, uh, my last letter, I told you about this letter. And, and, and this is the outcome of chapter 9, verse 2. We see more evidence of this occurring. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that the archaic Corinthians have been ready since last year. In other words, what happened was this. The Macedonian church, by word of mouth, heard about how the Corinthian church in, 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 in um, 1 Corinthians, when they heard about this, this offering, do you know what the reaction was to the Corinthian church when they heard about this offering? In, in, in um, 1 Corinthians, first heard about it, they were excited and enthusiastic. They wanted to give them to the Lord. So guess how, guess how the Macedonians heard about it? Through the Corinthian church. And they're excited. And they're excited to sit there and, and, and to do these. Wow. Paul was reminding the Corinthians of their past testimony. In other words, the reason these Macedonian churches wanted to give was because they heard about this. Paul was reminding the Corinthians of their past testimony of giving, not to guilt them into giving, but to remind them of the joy of giving. He was reminding the Corinthian church, do you remember the excitement you had about giving to the Lord? Do you remember what it was like? They had an impact on this church in Macedonia who was poor and gave everything they had. Wow. We said the Macedonians pleaded with Paul to participate in the offering in Jerusalem in verse 4. It says this, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. What it did the church in Macedonian do. They begged. They pleaded. With Paul. They said, Paul. We want to give too. Just because you we're poor. Just because we live in poverty. Doesn't mean we can't give. Let me get it. Paul. Let this church give unto the Lord. Listen, in our Americanized culture, a lot of preaching sounds more like a commercial than true teaching of the Word of God. I've heard preachers say that if you want to, if you don't get your 10%, that you're robbing God. Wow. My friends, this is manipulation. Nowhere in the scripture does Paul or any other New Testament writer mention a fixed amount or percentage. 
nowhere. Tithing is an Old Testament concept, but we do use tithing as a measuring rod or a tool in the New Testament in our giving. But it's not a requirement. See, the church in our text saw giving as a privilege. As a privilege. To my friends, this, my friends, is the absolute truth of grace giving. Lastly, in closing, we look at the aspect of worshipful giving. First raw aspect of grace giving is what? Relational giving. Then we have the absolute truthful giving. Now we see worshipful giving. In verse 5 we read, And this, and this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God above. Hmm. The heart of the Macedonian church is what? Worship. They're giving wasn't just for the sake of giving. Their giving was an act of worship. The heart of Macedonian church was the Lord. They did not give it to the Lord so that they could have better stuff. They did not give it to the Lord so that they could be rich with material possessions. Instead, they gave as an act of submissive worship unto the Lord. These people were totally abandoned to the cause of Christ. They gave of themselves. Giving is an act of sacrificial worship. So not only do we see it was a submissive worship, we see it was a sacrificial worship. The giving of the church of Macedonia exemplifies what it means to be a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Romans 12, 1 through 2, Paul wrote, Therefore I urge you, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable God, which is your spiritual act of service and worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what, what, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. They gave them to the Lord as an act of worship, not so they could be seen, not so they could be heard, not so Paul could brag on them. They gave it because they wanted to be an act of worship to the Lord. They could care less who saw or any over. Listen, only when our lives are presented to Christ as a holy sacrifice does financial giving become an acceptable act of worship. Only when our lives are presented to Christ as a holy sacrifice, listen, listen to me, if we are holding things back in our own life as a spiritual act of worship, then giving really won't be an act of worship. Whenever we are living our lives in total abandonment to the cause of Christ, then giving is an act of worship. Amen. It's an act of worship. Paul was reminding the Corinthian church what it means to give to the Lord. My friend, this morning we are going, we are being reminded this morning of what it means to give to the Lord. Listen, I've never been a preacher. To beg people for money. And I never will be that person. I don't beg people for money. In fact, I'm going to tell you what, this boy, I hate fundraising with passion. I hate. Can I say that a little stronger? I hate with a passion. I hate it. In fact, one of the reasons I left the church is because I had to fundraise and do ministry. We ran off a $30,000 budget and they only gave me $2,000 to do it. I spent half my time raising money. I felt more like a salesman than I did preach. The scripture tells that the church is to supply, supply the needs of what church? You've heard me say that the gospel is free, but ministry is not. Gospel free ministry is not. Everything that we do is to minister to our community, guess what it costs money? It costs money. Everything we do costs money. But I'm so thankful a pastor of this church that we have people who do give. I'm very, very appreciative of that. I'm thankful for that. This we might be a small church, but we're giving to it. We're giving to it. Now listen, this old boy, I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about it. And in fact, in next month, we're, and in fact, I'm really going to treat in a couple of weeks, we'll be moving into our new building. And I'm excited about that. That's good. 
want. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see what God's going to do. Listen, we'll be able to minister to our community in a whole new and efficient way. We'll be able to do things we haven't been able to do as a church body. Listen, there's going to be a few upgrades that our church will have to make in our new facility. We'll have to put carpet down. We'll have to uh, build stages or a little altar area. We'll have to make sound babble. We'll have to get things ready for kids, teenagers, and all kinds of stuff. All that costs money. It costs money. Listen, because we're going to be in, in a more permanent place, guess what? You know, we're renting this out week to week because where we're going, guess what it's going to do? Our expense is going to go It's going to happen. Facilities cost. Church buildings cost. If you want to do ministry within a community, how the house is worth it, it costs. It costs. I told you, ministry, gospel's free, ministry's not. So listen, I'm asking you this morning, guess what? Just keep giving to the Lord. Just keep giving to the Lord. And listen, when you give to the Lord, I tell people this all the time, give it to the Lord to lead you. Give to the Lord as he leads you. Because you don't give for me. And listen, I never want to be accused of ever pressuring anyone to write out a check. I don't do that. I got friends of mine who I don't see how they got how they live with themselves. I've heard preachers go into people uh, who were fixing to die and saying, Would you go? And this is no joke, just heard about this a few weeks ago. I know the guy. The guy's fixing to die, and he goes and he says, Listen, why don't you just sign your state over to the church? And guess what? He wasn't a prosperity camp, he was a fine Southern Baptist preacher. I've had preachers I know go to people in the church who had money and say, listen, man, I know you got about three or four cars. Why don't you sell that car over there and you just get the proceeds to the church? They go out and beg for money. I don't do that. I don't see how folks like that live with themselves. I believe the church, this is not my church, it's God's church. Amen. And it's not your church, it's God's church. Amen. And he'll supply the needs however he sees fit. My desire as a pastor is I want to see people give as an act of worship. Because guess what? When we give as an act of worship, God will take that money and he'll, he'll, he'll make it more money. He'll take it and he'll use it. And that's what he's going to do. So let's go to the Lord in prayers. Heavenly Father God, we come before you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be a people who can give as an act of worship. Lord, you've given us everything. You gave of yourself. You gave everything to who you are. Lord, you left glory to walk among us. Oh, Lord. Thank you for giving us everything that we do have. But it's not ours. It's all yours. Lord, be with us as we go into our new facility. Lord, we just go before you and we just trust you with it all. And uh, we love you in your precious name we pray. Amen.